Right, everybody, welcome. Apologies, apologies about the fire alarm. Apparently, it's a regular fault that we just listened to. <laughs> anyway, we'll get it fixed. We'll get it fixed. Anyway, I am delighted. And um, most of you, I think, have probably already met Jay, Professor Parikh. And um, I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was at a breast meeting in Savannah in May. Uh, and I heard him give, give this fantastic talk on wellness and burnout and um, kind of went and spoke to him and just, you know, complimented him on what he'd been saying and invited him to Cambridge and he said, yeah, you're welcome. So, hey, we are the, we are the benefactors here. Uh, Jay is a Canadian originally, uh, brought up in Vancouver. Hey! Then, oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> then I was a Canadian. Um, Watch out now, there's two of us. <laughs> So, uh, so medical school in Ottawa, and then interned in Toronto, residency at Queens and Kingston, and did my fellowship then, at the Susan Coleman Breast Center in Illinois. And then, yeah, then Chicago was that right for a time, and then private practice, and then decided to go. Had a, got a great offer to go to Houston, and um, in academia. Then, but what I so he's a breast radiologist, and what I don't know. But maybe you're going to share with us is how you then began majoring in wellness and, and uh, supporting colleagues and things. So maybe we'll hear about that in a sure. But thank you so much for coming along. We've had, it's been a lovely 24 hours already, and I hear you've been having a really interesting afternoon. So, so thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, Dr. Gilbert Carlos, uh, I think my face is being cut off here on the screen on the Zoom. Let's see if we can make a small adjustment for the benefit of those at home. Oh, we need the owl up here. Hello, owl. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, owl. Speak to us. Thank you. A rotation machine. No, it needs to be All right. So the bad news is you people at home on the Zoom now have to see my face. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, those of you here live will see my back when I'm presenting. But if you have any questions, I can see you from the side of my eyes. Please feel free to ask any questions. Um, my name is Jay Barik. I'm a professor of radiology at the University of Texas MD Answer Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. And uh, Dr. Gilbert just eloquently said the story. We were on the podium together at the Society of Breast Imaging meeting uh, this past spring in Savannah. Dr. Gilbert uh, was formerly president of the USOBI, and she was invited to come give a presentation. And I had the privilege of sharing the podium with her. Fantastic lecture as always on AI. And afterwards, we started to collaborate and meet. And I really appreciate the invitation here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I have no relevant conflicts to disclose. Uh, I would like to thank a number of people, uh, Dr. Barker and Dr. Healy, uh, for your wonderful hospitality these last few days. Uh, Ms. Sarah Perkins for connecting the dots so well. Fortunately, there was a taxi waiting for me at the airport, so I was able to make it here from London. So I'm very grateful to her. And special thanks again, Fiona, for just being uh, the wonderful queen of radiology that you are, fantastic leader, thank you. Uh, just to make sure we start off on the same foot, those of you remotely and those of us here who were not at earlier sessions, I wanna make sure we're really clear and when we discuss topics like burnout and wellness. And by the way, uh, the preparation for this talk, and I don't apologize for it, will be over 100 publications, whether you indirectly or directly referenced. I always use this opportunity to basically uh, present science in a methodical fashion to enhance practice, whether I give talks in breast imaging, whether I talk about operations, or I talk in this case about wellness. So I don't apologize for that in advance at the end. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd appreciate if we can hold off questions till the end, if, if possible, so we don't get derailed out of respect for everybody's time. So let's begin by talking about burnout. Burnout now is a defined syndrome by the World Health Organization that results from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. And we emphasize that this is in the workplace, not in the household domain. Um, if we actually look at uh, let's move forward. Uh, what the uh, 
World Health Organized specifies, it's actually a phenomenon in the occupational context and should not be applied to other areas of life. What are the three components of burnout? Briefly, they can be categorized as three dimensions based on the work of Dr. Christine Maslach at Berkeley and other uh, lead authors in this arena. The definition composes three specific domains of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and reduced personal accomplishment. Emotional exhaustion basically refers to having depleted physical, emotional abilities for tasks and feeling overextended. So the energy level is not what it used to be. The depersonalization dimension is manifest from cynicism or negative or detached responses and feeling lack of motivation for coming to work. Uh, reduced personal accomplishment usually is uh, transmitted as being feeling inadequate, ineffective at work. Uh, the mnemonic is DID, meaning depleted, ineffective, and detached for those who use such things to memorize definitions. What is the difference between health and, well and wellness? Well, there's quite a significant difference, and we'll be specifically looking at wellness as a goal and not health. Wealth is defined as a state of complete physical, mental, and social being. Notice occupational is not included in that definition, and what it refers to is not just merely the absence of disease. There are multiple definitions of wellness. The one I think that most applies to those of us who practice in the health space is this definition proposed in academic psychiatry in 2018, where we discuss wellness as being defined by TOL, quality of life. This not only includes the absence of ill-being, not only the presence of complete, but actually positive reinforced physical, mental, and social constructs with an integrated experience for the human at the core. A specific note, this does, go across, sorry, both personal and work-life domains. Here is the model that we should probably ingrain in our cortex when we talk about mental health versus mental wellness. When we talk about people being healthy, there are four components of the construct of a human that we look at, mental, physical, occupational, and lastly, social. Now in this initial model, you can see they're all diagrammed to be different colors. Uh, different colors to diagram the fact that these are different constructs. But while they're complete, you can see they're not really harmonious and integrated. Uh, they're of different colors. In the world of actual wellness, what happens is all four of these actually form together a unified, harmonious relationship. And what we're trying to reach for all individuals is the core balance, which is diagrammed in green or the Zen, the equilibrium which we'd all like to actually feel. And as I was talking to the residents earlier today, a moment to kind of capitulate that moment in our brain, just think about that moment when you actually opened that letter or email, when you got accepted in the medical school, that moment that you knew life moving forward had actually been accomplished in a way that was positive and fulfilling. That's the moment you should characterize your current life and being to compared to that and where you are relative to that in terms of calibrating and characterizing your own current well-being. Burnout diagrammed in red here affects the occupational construct only. But the reality is, if the occupational contract is prohibitively being affected by burnout, ultimately, all the inner core can be affected by burnout, and ultimately, different, different constructs can be affected, including wellness. Now, I want to be upfront from the very beginning, and authors have talked about this in the literature. There are multiple unknowns and limitations to our assessment of burnout. The pathophysiology of burnout is not known. The origins are not known. Uh, we do not know how to prevent it at the current time, and treatment is, at best, controversial. However, that being said, as eloquently stated in this article in JAMA in 2018, there is clearly something important and worrisome happening to physician well-being. Speculation about its causes is a worthy place to start in developing scientific hypotheses that can ultimately lead to solutions for this. So those are the two. Why is burnout relevant to those of us who practice? Well, first of all, multiple studies have been carried out by the American Medical Association in which they survey multiple physicians that belong using the AMA master files. And what they've done repeatedly in 2011, 2014, 2017, and 2020, now we serially document for every specialty what the level of burnout has been. As we can see, for all specialties, there is variation in burnout. So this is not a fixed moment in time. Variation in burnout does exist, which gives us hope that we're able to reduce it in physicians and our colleagues. Radiology specifically is here. And as you can see, looking at it, it seems on the high side. How high is it? Well, if we look at the master file surveys over time using validated metrics and validated items, 
from 2011 to 2020, on the left-hand side uh, is, is the mean of all physicians in America that were surveyed in terms of their level of burnout. And on the right-hand side is radiologists. As we can consistently see in all four surveys, radiologists were experiencing higher burnout than those of other physicians. Important uh, slide to consider in terms of actual data supporting the existence and prevalence of burnout. These six studies were independently carried out by independent collaborators and teams. These six studies were then separately performed using validated items with numbers exceeding over 300 plus, except for one study, physicians of different subspecialty cohorts. The data was scientifically and statistically analyzed independently and submitted to the peer reviewed process. And in six separate peer reviewed journals, we're able to see that the prevalence of burnout it typically exceeds over 50%. Uh, the Chan article suggests 49 to 75% with the mean probably over 50%, which tells us that now in multiple peer-reviewed studies of specialty cohorts, we are consistently demonstrating a burnout of over 50%. So that the depth and breadth of literature definitely supports the prevalence of burnout. Now, one thing with these studies that are done with surveys, they are prone to response bias. What do I mean by that? If somebody is burned down and receives the response, they're more likely to answer it in theory. That being said, the caveat to that is somebody may be too burned out that they may not even respond at all. So there's questions about that, but just to try and actually address this situation, the American College of Radiology as part of its human workforce survey in 2018, uh, using the practice environmental database, surveyed all known radiologist leaders in the American college to ask them what they thought about burnout. And, sorry. Um, 55 percent of respondents reported that burnout was an extremely or very significant problem, and 22 percent reported that burnout is a significant problem. So that means over three out of four radiologist leaders uh, thought that burnout was something that needed to be addressed. So in summary, we have data now across the house of medicine, including radiology, data from practice leaders, and multiple subspecialty radiology cohort studies, which have demonstrated that burnout is real. The breadth as well as the depth of the literature, very much supports the fact that burnout is a real deal. Why is burnout important? Well, I wanna emphasize that multiple studies have now shown there is an association in cross studies, cross sectional studies of burnout with multiple outcomes. And these are at three different levels, the physician, the patient, and the organization. At the level of physician, burnout has been associated with sleep deprivation, cardiovascular issues, substance abuse, psychological changes, and even suicidal ideation as demonstrated in studies of surgeons and oncologists. In terms of patient care, burnout has not been associated with medical errors. So there are patient safety issues associated with physician burnout. There's lower quality of care, lower patient satisfaction scores, longer recovery times. Also not demonstrated here, there's probably more uh, medical legal lawsuits as well associated with patient care secondary to burnout. Organizationally, there is reduced productivity been demonstrated repeatedly with burned out positions, reduced job commitment, outbursts of unprofessional behavior in the workplace. And there's also a contagious component of burnout where in our teams, when we are burnt out, more than likely other members of the team feel it can be burned out as well. And that is a reciprocal relationship where we can feel each other's. Pain. As I mentioned from the get go, though, while we've defined burnout and we've explained it, and it is an important metric for us to look at. We want to transition from just focusing on burnout to actually getting to brilliance, to wellness. So how do we do that if we want to extend our conversation beyond burnout? Well, what I'm going to present to you here is the professional fulfillment model that was wonderfully and elegantly created by the people at Stanford. Their wellness team put this together. And what they said is that professional fulfillment can be attained by three individual components. And these are individual, but they're also synergistic with each other. One is a culture of wellness, Secondly, efficiency of practice. And third, personal resilience. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that professional fulfillment, as they've defined it, is somebody attaining their goals in life or feeling like they're on their goal in their path in life. So uh, either way, we're in the positive energy moment, feeling invigorated. Three components. I'm going to start briefly talking about resiliency, spending most of the time talking about culture. And lastly, a few comments about operations. So in this model uh, described by Dr. Menon and colleagues, what they look at is the soul being composed of and well-being composed of physical wellness, social wellness, and wellness of mind at its core. The blue ring around it is actually the personal resilience. 
and outside are external stressors we always feel in our life. If one has uh, increased personal resilience as demonstrated here, you have a thicker blue ring which can protect you from when stressors become higher. However, if your resilience is lower, then the stressors can reach down deeper and deeper towards the soul and theoretically upset your well being. Now, if we look at the literature, and this is not a complete list, multiple attempts have been done and multiple studies have been done trying to improve physician resilience specifically in the context of reducing burnout and improving well being. Meditation, mindfulness, gratitude journaling, positive psychology, yoga, Zumba, exercises, nature walks. All of these are individually important and by no means we want to ignore them. But as we'll see, uh, the question is how much do these really impact as opposed to other components? Now, the one thing I would like to emphasize is coaching specifically. There was a really nice study carried out at the Mayo Clinic where they had a randomized trial of 88 physicians. 44 were allocated to the uh, interventional trial with coaching and 44 were subject to control who were not coached. Six coaching sessions were performed at, at a cost overall of $1,400 per physician. The interventional arm found that the burnout decreased by 17%, whereas the control arm, burnout increased by 5%. So comparing those two, that's almost a 21% plus improvement in the intervention from coaching. Another study was carried out though, that actually tried to look at all studies. And this is an incredible amount of work that was done in Lancet in 2016, led by a uh, uh, members of the Mayo Clinic, specifically Dr. West and colleagues. And when we look at the interventions to prevent and reduce physician burnout, they reviewed 2,617 studies of which they found 44 randomized control trials and 186 observational studies were reviewed. In the end, only 15 eligible studies from the randomized control trials and 37 eligible studies were maintained in terms of quality issues or questions about the actual validity of the data. In their meta-analysis, again, the amount of burnout was reduced from 54% to 44%, which tells us that burnout is not static. But when they looked at this, they were diplomatic. And when most of the data suggested that most of the improvement was in process, they did say both individual focused and structural or organizational strategies can result in meaningful, meaningful reductions in burnout. However, I don't know if you're aware of this, there's a recent article which really pushes the envelope of where we should be focusing our attention. This study looked at resilience and burnout amongst physicians versus the general US population. This is an incredible amount of work. cross national national survey of 5,444 physicians versus almost 5,200 individuals in the US working population. And the physicians repeatedly exhibited higher levels of resilience than the general population working in the United States. Moreover, resilience was inversely associated with burnout symptoms, yes, but burnout rates were substantial even amongst the most resilient physicians. So focusing on resiliency probably is not gonna stop the issues we have with burnout. Physicians overall do not have a deficit in resilience. Additional solutions, including efforts to address system issues in the clinical care environment are needed to reduce burnout and promote physician well-being. In the end, what I'm seeing, what the rest of this talk is gonna be on is we need to shift the focus from rather redesigning our people, our radiologists and healthcare colleagues, to instead now focusing on redesigning the work process, which is the hard work that wellness teams will have to do moving forward. So let's move on and let's talk first of all about, and I will emphasize that'll be the bulk of this talk because culture is the same conversation no matter where we go, right? Culture is the soul of who you are as an organization. And if your organization and your team wants to help improve burnout of individuals in your practice, the culture needs to start. How are we gonna look at the culture? Well, this wonderful article uh, was published in the mail defines nine separate ways that we can actually address culture. And we're gonna look at scientific data in each of these individual steps that can be done that can actually help us in terms of addressing burnout. So first step number one is acknowledging and assessing the problem. How do we start? Well, we can measure burnout using any of the validated items. Uh, I heard today uh, from Susie that y'all are using the Oldenburg inventory, which is fine. In the United States, the ones we typically use more historically have been the MBI, the Maslach burnout inventory. 23 questionnaires, but it's very time consuming and we have a low history of a low physician response rate because of the rate of the questionnaire. More and more, uh, the physician wellness academic consortium institutions such as ours, using more of the Stanford PFI, the professional fulfillment index, uh, because it's free for those of us who belong to the PWAC and we can actually use it for research purposes and has been validated recently against the MBI by the people at Stanford. Um, if you want to start, you can look at focus groups, gather stakeholder input, and then start to move forward the needle. The important thing is just gathering the information is not alone. Action needs to follow. 
the mission statement in the, in the department or the organization needs to actually say in bold letters, the value of wellness to the organization. Physician leadership should be recruited that actually emphasizes and is passionate about wellness. Congratulations to this department for already done that as steps ahead of other departments we see. And then follow-up is required to make sure that we actually see that we, the interventions we're working are actually working. Secondly, we need to understand the power of leadership. And I would show this piecemeal at various times, but this is one of the iconic state, uh, studies that we wanna really emphasize today. At the Mayo Clinic, they surveyed 3,896 physicians of which 72%, almost 2,800 uh, scientists and physicians responded to this actual uh, survey, which wanted to look very specifically at the impact of organizational leadership on physician burnout and, and satisfaction. Again, validated tools we used and respondents rated leadership qualities of this immediate supervisor. And by the way, these 12 questions ultimately became known as a leadership score or leadership index score, which is still being used today by the PWAC. And I'll just describe them and you can think for yourself if, if these were trademarks or not that you would wanna see in a leader that you were following. The, the uh, leader actually has conversations with me about career development. The leader inspires me to do my best. The leader empowers me. The leader interested in me, my opinion. The leader encourages employee ideas. The leader treats me with respect and dignity. <clears throat> Next, the leader provides feedback and coaching. The leader recognizes me. The leader keeps me informed about changes. The leader encourages me to develop as a person. I would recommend working for this leader. Overall, I am very satisfied with this leader. Think of 12 questions in your mind that you would think of. I would bet you year 12 would probably overlap these 12 in terms of what you'd want in a leader. The study found that for each one point increase in leadership score, there was a 3.3% decrease in likelihood of burnout of the physicians and scientists and a 9% increase in satisfaction. Therefore, the leadership qualities of physician supervisors appear to impact the well being and satisfaction of individual physicians. And we'll talk about more leadership data shortly. <clears throat> how does the leaders burn out themselves affect their effectiveness? What they did in this large study at Stanford is they actually plotted the leadership score versus fulfillment. And the more burnt out the leader was, the lower was the effectiveness score by the people who actually followed them. More professionally fulfilled the leader was, the higher the leadership score by the people who followed them. Each one point increase in burnout score of the leaders was associated with a 0.19 point decrement leadership behavior score. And the conclusion, burnout, professional fulfillment and self-care practices of physician leaders were independently associated with their assessed leadership effectiveness. Is Carlos here? Something's wrong with his mouse. Carlos is never wrong. Sorry about that, we'll try and get this mouse looked at. So in terms of leadership, other things we did look at, remember was that survey from the American College of the Practice Leaders, and they asked them two questions. How effective are your mechanisms to assess burnout in your group? And secondly, do you have mechanisms at all to assess physician burnout in your group? And the answer was very similar. Only about one in five physician leaders in the United States thought they either had mechanisms or were effective in addressing physician burnout. It goes to show how elusive this whole process is. So what strategies can physicians incorporate to actually address as leaders in their team the whole issue of burnout? Well, number one, repeatedly building teams has been shown to be by consensus, very helpful. And how do you do this? Well, first of all, if you can... It's moving around. So um, one of the ways we can do this is to learn unique skill sets of our team members. A really nice study done at the Mayo Clinic showed that 20% of the time, if a physician spent time on something that was professionally meaningful for them, they would actually find that job satisfying. Now that could be academics, it could be a research project, it could be doing uh, philanthropy, it could be doing something in the community. It's variable for everybody. But 20% of the time, if they do that, they could find the job more meaningful. Another thing a leader can do is recognize individuals in their group for what they've done. 
And I want to emphasize recognition is not about stroking physicians' egos. Recognition is a form of social acceptance and trying to bring a community feeling to our colleagues. Emails of good pickups, acknowledging them when their metrics are high in terms of cancer detection rate, for example, in Western imaging, blast emails about their performance and research project, all are very well received by physicians. The second thing a leadership team can do is prepare a business case. And there's various steps that need to be done for this. Number one, there needs to be a shift in the mindset of us versus them. The physician leaders who are gonna be responsible for wellness almost invariably at some point need to develop a collaborative relationship with senior leadership at the institution. It's hard to be the lone ranger on this. If you get stakeholder buy-in above you and manage up effectively, then you're more likely to be successful in getting wellness as, a, as an actual core priority of the organization. <clears throat> there are shared things that we actually have, believe it or not, as physicians with administration that we both want. We want patient safety. We want high patient experience scores, right? Because we want to have higher safety scores and because we want higher patient care, this is a shared issue and a shared responsibility that we need to work on together. And that should be the mindset to be able to address this. We need to erase misperceptions about burnout and how it's not scientific and make sure we walk away from the table trying to figure out a way to work on this together. The business case can be made from multiple studies. I'm not as a honestly aware of all the studies in care in Europe, but now the AMA has done a very deep analysis of the actual direct and indirect costs of physician turnover. And the range is $500,000 to a million dollars cost to replace a physician. And radiologist is probably higher because most of the averages these numbers are based off range anywhere from two to three times a physician's salary. Yeah. There's actually, a, unbelievably, an independent assessment that was done by an insurance company, well, <laughs> Atrius, that looked at their costs as a health organization to replace the physician who left, and they came up with the same numbers as the AMA. Stanford did the analysis of loss of recruitment over two years from burnout. Their estimate was somewhere between 15 to $55 million of cost to the organization from burnout alone. In employed models, the annual cost is somewhere around $7,600 per employee physician. The third strategy that should be employed by wellness teams who are leading roles are role models. They need to attend socials, uh, use appropriate emails and etiquette, we'll talk about that shortly, and pledge self-care and be role models for the people that follow them. This includes hours of work, amount of sleep they do to make sure they're functioning, role models for making sure they do get some form of exercise and actually take their days off so other people and their teams feel like it's okay to take their days off from work as well. Lastly, I think the new leaders of the future for wellness will have to accept limitations. There will be some self-accountability. There will be upward feedback in terms of how they're performing. Training will be required. We're seeing that more and more. Our institution has implemented that now for our leaders. And terms probably will ultimately come around like most medical director positions these days. Next, we're going to talk about creating a community at work. Nice study carried out at Mayo Clinic again. Uh, looked at 74 physicians that were randomized, 37 were the allocated intervention arm, 37 were controlled. And basically the 37 in the primary analysis, two withdrew, so we had 35, uh, basically were involved in 19 biweekly physician discussion groups. And they incorporated elements of mindfulness, reflection, shared experience, and small group learning. This went on for nine months. Unbelievably, the rates of depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and overall burnout decreased substantially. Uh, and the p-values are listed there. And the other thing that was really impressive is this was sustained 12 months later. So it seems to have an effect on people. Next, why does values alignment matter? Well, again, we talked about the role leaders have and, and multiple studies have shown this trend now. If, on the left, what we're seeing is the burnout score of the physicians in the organization versus their actual values alignment with the organization. In other words, if my value with the organization is in sync, how does that do in terms of my actual burnout? And it turns out that the more you were burned out, right, the lower was your alignment score with the institution. Similarly, the lower your value alignment score was in the institution, the more likely you're not going to be less fulfilled. Over and above that, they actually again looked at the supervisor leadership score. And what they found was if you were more aligned with the institution, you were more likely to actually be in an organ in the in a work unit where you had a higher leadership score. Again, showing the role of leadership. 
So in summary, personal organizational value alignment scores demonstrated an inverse correlation with burnout, while there was a positive correlation with professional fulfillment. Each one point in increase in leadership score of the immediate supervisor was associated with a 0.56 increase in PO values. Most important conclusion, physicians experienced their organization through the prism of their work unit leader. Again and again and again, we're seeing peer reviewed studies and data showing the real impact leadership has on physician wellness. Next, we're gonna talk about work-life integration. And the, I mentioned before the studies that were carried out from the AMA master files looking at work-life balance and burnout amongst radiologists compared to other physicians. In this particular study, we're actually on the uh, X axis looking at the percentage reporting burnout and on the Y axis talking about the percent actually satisfied with the work-life index. Whereas radiology, we're right over here. So it turns out, believe it or not, while again, we had a high reporting level of burnout compared to other specialties, Compared to a lot of other specialties, we were relatively satisfied with our work-life uh, index. However, that doesn't mean there's not opportunities to improve. Here's an example of one opportunity. An ACR study was carried out by the Human Resources Commission using a survey of practice leaders to find out the number of lactation facilities to support women who were breastfeeding in their institution. Only 13% actually had dedicated lactation facilities to support women who were lactating. Another opportunity may be rethinking how we want to approach the Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, and what we found in this was that there was about 23% of radiologists, that's almost one in four, at some point or other had to take FMLA back in 2016. Now, yes, it was mostly women taking care of a newborn or adopted child, but there's a myth that FMLA is only a, as a gender specific issue. The second most common reason for people taking FMLA was a personal serious health condition, and this was predominantly males. Other issues, caring for an immediate family member and engaging in active military duty, also had a significant number of men involved as well. So this is a radiologist-wide issue that needs to be addressed. What opportunities are there to maybe increase work-life balance? Every institution is different, but I'm going to share with you three leading institutions, what they've done to improve work-life balance. At the University of Pittsburgh, they have now uh, supplied all their breast radiologists with dedicated mammal reading workstations in their home so they can read remotely screening and things like that. And that's been very well received by the radiologists I've talked to from there. At Johns Hopkins, they've actually adjusted shift hours in abdominal radiology now in a way that people can get done by four o'clock more. It's been very well received by their physicians. At MD Anderson Cancer Center, we have some of the most complex cancer patients in the world. If there are really end of day complex MRI studies, we decided as a team after three o'clock or whatever time, they can be left in the person in the morning when they're ready to go, have more energy. We'll, we'll take that case on and be happy to read it. And we have not had any complaints about that model since. Also more and more groups in, uh, across the country, not just these institutions, but across the country are thinking more about offering part-time work for people who are interested. Lastly, self-care. Um, we talked about this a couple of times earlier today, and I know this is repetitive for some of you, but this is really one of the most iconic studies that have been carried out in the wellness state in the last 10 years. The clinician self-valuation scale is a four item scale that assesses two things. Number one, do you defer your self-care to meet work demands? And number two, do you treat yourself harshly when you have personal imperfections and errors? Because many of us in medicine are perfectionists. We may as well just own that. This study, and I don't think it's going to be really hard to repeat. This had over five academic medical centers, over almost 3,900 physicians responded. And what we found is that there was almost a direct inverse correlation between burnout and self-valuation. The more we valued ourselves in terms of self-care and in terms of being honest with ourselves and accepting that we're not perfect and we are imperfect, the lower our risk of being able to burn down. What are we talking about? Again, hours of work, sleep, exercise, and days off. And sleep has been shown in multiple studies now using the promise metric scale that sleep does have an impact on burnout. One of the things we also need to do is start to do more work in terms of identifying stressors in individual subspecialties that may actually uh, create some of the burnout that we're actually experiencing. This is actually a study that was carried out uh, at the Society of Breast Imaging in the United States where we are relatively bananas about lawsuits compared to you all here in Europe. Lawsuits were the number three stressors that were identified amongst our, our practicing radiologists, right behind work-life balance and practicing faster. And the data has shown repeatedly that there is a second victim when these adverse effects happen. Yes, the patient has had issues that have happened, but the person who actually read the image can sometimes feel very badly and traumatized by the whole experience. 
This is not unique to radiology. People who've been experiencing, who've been involved in trauma on the wards, not just physicians, the whole team can experience this sort of grief and loss for years sometimes later. And so it's important to have an opportunity to reach out and support the peer. I'm proud to say at Anderson, one of the things we have is a practitioner peer assistance committee or PPAC, which I serve. Uh, Dr. Uh, you can see the name of our mayor, uh, Karan Hodge, he's actually in charge of it. Fabulous job as a psychiatrist. Essentially, in a nutshell, what I wanted to emphasize here is when you move away with people having issues from the education part to the prevention side, it's the United States. We're not necessarily obligated to uh, keep records on individuals. Once they go into the treatment side, and especially the disciplinary side, that's a different conversation. So while we're still on the prevention side, people can reach out to us, talk to us about what's been going on, and it's all confidential. And we try and make sure we try and answer their questions and, 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 and you know, feel and empathize with our candidates as they're going through. Equally important, we can refer them to equally confident, confidential mental health counseling if required as well. Lastly, science is something that we're gonna to have to look at more and more. Every organizational culture is different. So every organization ideally should be participating in some type of science. Um, and when it comes to wellness. And we need to understand now, as we talked about earlier, while most of the data so far has been presented for radiologists, burnout can affect all disciplines and then the contagious team model affect all of us. Uh, the work by Dr. Teslav looked at uh, physician assistants in oncology showed they had a 48.7% burnout. If we look at nurses in a study that was carried out by Dr. Uh, Dr. Derby, Lottie Derby, 35%. Again, nurse practitioners, almost 37%. So we're not alone, our teams are feeling this too. The National Academies of Science Medicine has now actually prioritized this in this statement. Research involving non-physician healthcare workers has been identified as a priority now by us, and they are working on this. So we talked about resiliency. We spent most of the talk talking about culture deliberately because it's probably the lowest hanging fruit for us to make an impact in terms of addressing burnout in our departments and our organizations. But the last thing we wanna talk about is operations. Um, this is a, the model that the AMA actually uses online to talk about drivers of burnout. It was adapted from the Mayo model. Now, assuming at the very core that somebody actually has meaning and work, and we're gonna assume that, there are six identified drivers that actually uh, contribute to burnout. Efficiency and resources, workload and job demands, control and flexibility, work-life integration, social support and community at work, and lastly, organizational uh, values and culture. If we have a more optimal situation where these workloads and everything else are not affecting us in a negative way, we're more likely to feel engaged with vigor, dedication, and absorption. Less optimally, then we start to experience the dimensions of burnout. But as I want to explain in this slide here, and I want to thank Dr. Kowalski, who used to be our faculty wellness lead for the whole MD Anderson, shared with me, at least in the United States, and I think to a large extent from what I'm hearing here as well, it's a deeper dive that needs to be done when we talk about individual practices because every place has different operations. That's the reality of it. In the United States, let's just take, for example, um, something like efficiency and resources. Well, individual factors will depend on the experience of the physicians in that department and their individual personal efficiency, right? Working in factors, how much support staff do we have? Do we have, for example, reading room coordinators that can get us our old images for us or do we have to chase them down ourselves? Institutional efficiency is a great point to bring out too. Some institutions have more rapid, robust EMRs than others, which makes an impact. And lastly, integration of care. So if I find, for example, a breast cancer diagnosis, how much am I responsible for making sure that patient gets referred to see a surgeon or oncologist? And how much can I leave that to other people like nurse practitioners or nurse navigators to help me with, depending on my institution? So because every one of these, that's just one example, but if you take all of these, all of these can make an impact. Now, one thing we can do is look at articles and have tried to categorize the major work, uh, the risk factors for burnout. On the professional side, which is published in this article in 2019 by Dr. Chetland and colleagues, uh, these are the six of the main categories that were identified as professional risk factors for burnout. We've already talked about the last four, but let's look at the first two, workload and longer hours. What can we do about that? So one of the things that We can look at is scheduling outside priors, having internal priors, reducing interruptions, and having physician extenders. All these individual factors can reduce the workload. As well, we can also scientifically analyze it with appropriate workload analysis tools. This is an article by Dr. Connors, which is published in JBI, 
they use, for example, the lean principles and the Hedjunka model to see if we could actually find out a way to make things more efficient, and it's been working for them. In terms of organizational risk factors, again, from the same paper in 2019, these are six of the major themes that actually contribute to uh, individual physician burnout. The two that we have not looked at at length is the EMR and PACS. I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about this. Uh, there's an article in 2018 that shows that probably the number of emails that an individual receives in a day correlates with the risk of potentially developing burnout. Now, I don't know about your organization specifically, but at MD Anderson, we're a very email-centric culture. We can't keep up with the number of emails. It just multiplies exponentially over the course of a day. And so one of the things our chair did in our department, she's been very effective and liked by our department, Dr. Yang said, okay, that's it. After five o'clock on Friday until eight o'clock on Monday, unless there's an acute response needed for a patient issue or some emergency that you need to email somebody, emails should now be stopped during that time to enable work-life balance. And it's been very well received. Now, that does mean at 8.01 a.m. when we walk in on Monday, we'll have a lot of emails, <laughs> but it's a step in the right direction. And uh, you know, also limiting access and extraneous emails, if you can get filters to help you, that's another way of limiting email. Try and please, no matter how stressed you are, remember to use good etiquette in your emails. Greeting somebody, saying thank you, means a lot. We just had in the last session pockets about uh, related to professionalism. This is an incredible study talking about the impact of health information technology that was carried out. They actually surveyed all 4,197 practicing physicians in the state of Rhode Island. And they got a 43% response rate. And in that study, 26% reported burnout. Amongst electronic health record users, 91%, 70% reported health information technology related stress. And notice all these correlations. If the physicians reported poor marginal time for documentation, they had 2.8 times the odds of burnout. If they spent moderately high excessive time on EHRs at home, they had 1.9 times the burnout. If they agreed that their EHRs added to their daily frustration, 2.4 times the burnout. And there are multiple studies that have showed this repeated trend that the time on the EHR is a source of potential frustration for physicians and it can no longer be ignored. HIT related stress is measurable, it's common, is specialty related and independently predictive of burnout symptoms. So what can we do about it? New IT and updated IT training for new physicians, especially with new techniques is helpful. Uh, having physician champions who actually have input at the EMR table to make sure that we can reduce unnecessary button clicks is very helpful. And alleviating after hour coverage as much as possible. Now, there's an article that was written years ago, and I have the privilege of co-authoring us because people often ask me, where do you start? We want to actually start looking at burnout very seriously in our organization. Uh, in 2014, Paul Ellenbogen, who was chair of the, uh, of the uh, whole board of chancellors of the American College of Radiology, uh, started two commissions. He implemented two, diversity and human resources because the number of issues that were being recognized. And when we got uh, involved in the HR commission and we were asked to serve, um, we got a number of communications that really tugged at your heart and purse string. Uh, Dr. Gilbert was asking me one of the reasons I got involved in wellness is I remember serving on this and getting this email from a physician. He had just been diagnosed with cancer and uh, specifically his group was not able to support him or willing to support him anymore when his treatments got prolonged and finally that he had to leave. And uh, we heard about stories about the financial devastation it was for him and his family starts to make you wonder about why we are doing this to ourselves and to each other as colleagues, as physicians. We're allowed to have compassion to our patients. Why aren't we allowed to have compassion for each other? And so that's when I started getting more involved in the whole wellness space. And one of the things we did early is we started to realize all the data was coming around burnout, but nobody had really come up to a consensus position about what we can do in radiology. And so these were some of the early steps. And I think the article we wrote then is still as valid today as it was then. It's been cited almost 200 times. You know, having adequate staffing, reducing prolonged stress, restoring a sense of control for communication, teamwork, and transparency, reducing night and weekend obligations, restoring life balance by addressing needs of physical, emotional, and spiritual self, improving efficiencies of radiologists, developing reasonable financial goals and expectations, reducing the isolation of radiologists. I would say now more than ever after post-COVID, this isn't something we're going to have to look at, and seeking professional help for the organization and the affected individual. Notice they say the organization as well, if that's necessary. Now the triple aim, which was coded by uh, Don Burrick many years ago, and which has really been the 
core of what healthcare has been able to offer has three main goals, right? Enhancing the patient's experience, increasing the quality of care of the patients and reducing costs. That is the core values of anybody who does operations in the United States for healthcare. And everybody knows that. And the argument was made first, we need to move from the triple aim to the quadruple aim. Care of the patient requires care of the provider. And that's based on all the data we shared today. The one thing we did not address in 2016, well, it's probably in 2016, 2014, when we first addressed it, was something that was just coming out then, and we have more data now, that we need to move from a quadruple aim to a quintuple aim, because the quintuple aim for healthcare improvement needs that means that there must be a new imperative to advocate and advance health equity. The pursuit of health equity ought to be elevated as the fifth aim, purposely including with all improvement innovation efforts, a focus on individuals and communities who need them most. I've often said the best radiologists are the ones who have the sensitive eyes that when they look at the images in front of them, they recognize there's a patient attached to them. But I would say now moving forward, the most awesome radiologists are not only going to be the ones that do that, but also have the ears to know that there are people who can't speak up for themselves. Along those lines, if there's one thing I would do different in that article, I wish that we could actually talk about diversity more. We didn't because it wasn't as much data as there is now. But you know, as, as the Stanford model uh, teaches us when we take our courses there on, on development and uh, leadership roles and wellness, diversity, equity, and inclusion really is wellness. One can't be there without the other. So we looked at the definition of burnout versus wellness. We looked at the relevance, the resiliency, the culture, and operations. And I wish you the very best in your transition in your institution from burnout to brilliance. Thank you for your attention.